Okay, so after hearing about Alzheimer's disease and about uh, uh, Parkinson's disease and other side nucleopathies, uh, it, it's now the, the moment to change years to Huntington's disease, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Sara Tabrizzi from the University College of London. Although Sara's initial appointment at UCL was regarding prion diseases, and she actually made great contributions on the, on the proteostasis of prion proteins, in the last year, she has really focused her research on Huntington's disease by following the natural history in longitudinal studies of many big cohorts of patients, of Huntington's disease patients, and also presymptomatic carriers that had allowed to precisely define the evolution of the disease and the identification of the biomarkers that are being essential for the assessment of the clinical trials that are currently ongoing, and then she's also telling us the exciting results on the silencing clinical trials that are very advanced. And it is a great pleasure to have you here, Sarah. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me in such a beautiful venue. I don't think I've ever done a talk in, in uh, uh, oh, it's the other side. It's there, there. Sorry, we just set my laptop up. That's it. And then, let me get this. There. That goes in there. Thank you. There. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. So I'm going to talk to you about Huntington's disease. And actually, I've been, I've been working on Huntington's disease since 1996, which I did my PhD on Huntington's disease and Parkinson's disease. And uh, so it's been a focus of mine for a long time. And really, over the last five to ten years, I've been focusing exclusively on trying to find a treatment for Huntington's disease. So I'm going to cover um, a brief background on Huntington's disease for the audience, an overview of preclinical targets for therapy, an overview of approaches and development for Huntington lowering, and an update on antisense oligonucleotide therapy, which I've been working on for the last 10 years, particularly with Ionis Pharmaceuticals, for Huntington's disease, and show you some very exciting data from the recent spinal muscular atrophy trial. And so Huntington's disease is the commonest genetic dementia. So we know the cause, we know the target for therapy, and it's mutant Huntington. If you don't have mutant Huntington, you don't get the disease. It's dominantly inherited, it's fully penetrant, and the mean age of onset is 40. And it's rare, but not so rare, it's got a prevalence of about 1 in 8,000. And this uh, video is fairly poor quality, but I just want to, sorry, I'll just go back. This video is actually of a patient with Huntington's disease showing you ballistic chorea. So this is what lots of our patients look like. We have to nurse them on mattresses on the floor, and this is what bad, severe chorea looks like. It's uncontrolled movements. And Huntington's disease is a slowly progressive disease, and the advanced stage of the disease, again, it's quite a poor quality video, but it's important because I, I really want to get across that the advanced stage of the disease lasts about five to ten years. People are unable to move, they're unable to speak, swallow, and they're completely akinetic and rigid. And so Huntington's disease over a period of about 20 years, devastates people and families. And this is a, a young man that I looked after with juvenile Huntington's disease. He developed the disease when he was 11 years old. He's 16 in this video. He's very stiff and Parkinsonian. His mum is there. Her husband died of Huntington's disease at the age of 33. Amar died a few years ago at the age of 21, and so did Amar's sister at the age of 23. So this mother had her husband and two children, all to die from Huntington's disease. The mutation is in the first exon of the Huntington's gene, and if you inherit more than 40 CAG repeats, you'll develop the disease at some point in your life. It encodes a protein Huntington, a large 350 kilodalton protein that's expressed in all tissues in the body. 
There are many pathogenic cellular mechanisms in Huntington's disease pathophysiology, many downstream pathways that are very common to other neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, evidence for protein aggregation, impairment of the proteostasis network, synaptic dysfunction, axonal transport. These uh, neurodegenerative diseases co share common cellular pathogenic pathways. And this is it's a busy slide, but the reason I'm showing you it is that these are all the different preclinical therapeutic targets for Huntington's disease. And what's very clear, and I think really all of my work now focuses on this, is that there are many downstream cellular pathways. But in Huntington's disease, it might be too late. And so so all of my focus is on therapies that are targeting the DNA and the RNA right at the beginning, the causative mechanism. So it doesn't matter what the downstream pathways are, you're targeting the disease at its source. And there are a number of different therapies that are in development that are targeting DNA and RNA. There's CRISPR, this is being really in cell lines at the moment. The challenge of CRISPR is how do you deliver it to the human brain, and I'm happy to discuss that, but we're years away from that being realistic. Zinc finger protein, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, which is an alleoselective approach targeting DNA. I'm going to talk to you about antisense oligonucleotide therapy, which I've been working on for the last 10 years, and we're uh, now two years into the first human trial. There's also RNA targeting Huntington mRNA, and these are all approaches under development. There are many challenges in developing molecular therapies for diseases like Huntington's disease, targeting DNA and RNA, and these are common to all diseases. So what do you treat with? When do you treat? Obviously, these are long neurodegenerative conditions with long uh, uh, clinical progression. We want to treat early, and ideally, we want to treat pre-symptomatically. Where in the, do you want to treat? At the moment, gene therapy approaches cannot target the whole human brain, and so you need to think about where you're going to treat and how. And I think, importantly, for these diseases, we want to try and start with agents that are reversible, and that you can titrate the dose. And so there's a lot of challenges in that area, particularly for gene therapy. So there are a number of Huntington lowering therapeutic delivery strategies under development. There are transient agents which are reversible, and the main ones here are antisense oligonucleotides. Gene therapy is a single shot permanent expression of the agent. And there are zinc finger proteins, microRNAs, and shRNAs, which I'm going to talk about. The delivery methods are intrathecal to get into the CSF, which is into the uh, spinal fluid, and intraparenchymal direct neurosurgical stereotactic surgery in the same way that has been done for fetal transplantation and deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease. And I think before you st start these sorts of trials, the key uh, uh, prerequisite for starting trials is do you have markers of target engagement and to show that actually you have interacted with your target and that you're altering the, your target. And that's a pharmacodynamic biomarker. And we spent a long time working on pharmacodynamic biomarkers of Huntington. We published the first studies of mutant Huntington in blood and in CSF. And so we were ready to be able to start human trials because we could measure mutant Huntington, our target, very sensitively in CSF. They're also developing PET imaging markers for Huntington. It's much more uh, uh, challenging because it's an intracellular protein, but that works ongoing. And so there are a number of Huntington lowering efforts now going on worldwide. And uh, the one I'm going to talk to you about, about today is the IONIS program. And that's the phase one, two study. Wave Life Sciences have just announced a trial to do an ASO intrathecally. Spark is Bev Davidson, um, uh, her uh, company with a microRNA. It's non allele selective intraparenchymal uh, injection into the striatum. That's still in preclinical work. Voyager and Sanofi Genzyme are about to start a, uh, a program with a Huntington mRNA 
um, uh, microRNA targeting intraparenchymal into the striatum. And I'm going to talk to you also about the Sangamo program, which is still preclinical, which is an allele selective approach with a zinc finger. So ASO therapy in Huntington's disease, it achieves Huntington lowering, but it doesn't eliminate Huntington. And I think that's important. Unlike gene therapy approaches, where it's more difficult to titrate the dose, we can actually titrate the dose quite um, uh, relatively easily. And a lot of work is, has to be done in non-human primates to, to look at that, and I'll show you that data. So it lowers Huntington, but it doesn't eliminate it. And they're diffusible. You can titrate the dose, they're stable, and I think importantly, particularly when we were starting the first hu in human study, the do it's completely reversible. So the, uh, there are a number of ASOs, but the ASOs that I'm going to talk to you about are the MOE ASOs, and they are so called because they have an MOE moiety that allows for affinity, stability, and tolerability, and allows them to stick around for a relatively long period of time. The, it's a 20 base pair oligonucleotide that binds the sense strand, and this has a backbone of phosphodiester and phosphothioate linkages that allow recognition by RNAs H1 through degradation, allows degradation through the RNAs H1 mechanism. Different ASOs have different degradation mechanisms, but this is the MOE um, uh, ASO design. And this has been about 30 years of development, um, uh, originally developed by Stanley Crook, who set up uh, the small biotech company, Ionis Pharmaceuticals. So the MOE ASOs do not cross the blood-brain barrier. They're too big, and you need to deliver them intrathecally. And, but there's a precedent for intrathecal drug delivery. It's very common in anesthetics. It's common for pain medication, and it's a commonly delivered um, uh, mode of delivery for chemotherapy. The MOE ASOs have long half-lives, and I'm going to show you some data, which means that you can dose infrequently. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about spi spinal muscular atrophy. Some of you may have heard about this uh, data because it's been quite groundbreaking. Spinal muscular atrophy is a terrible disease of kids. It's caused by recessive mutations in the SMN1 gene. And the severity of the phenotype in children relates to the number of residual copies they have of a sister gene, SMN2. And so the most severe type spinal muscular atrophy is infantile onset. 60% of the cases are infantile. Age of symptom onset is less than six months of age. They have a very short life expectancy. And the medium life expectancy is of about a year in age. They're never, never able to sit. The type 2 is a slightly later onset. Age of onset is just over six months. They have a shortened life expectancy, and they're able to sit or stand but not walk. And type 3 is the later onset, and they are able to, to eventually are able to walk, and they can live into adulthood. It depends on the severity, depends on the number of copies of the SMN2 gene, which takes on some of the um, uh, functions of the SMN1 gene. So nucinicin was an antisense oligonucleotide developed by Ionis Pharmaceuticals a number of years ago, and it targets the SMN2 gene through alternative splicing. So basically, it alter it, through alternative splicing, upregulates the levels of SMN2 mRNA. And so... 250 children have been dosed with nucinicin. Some have been on the drug for up to four years. No safety or tolerability concerns were identified. The drug is given intrathecally into the spinal fluid. What was important, because we learned a lot from this trial for our Huntington's trial, demonstrate target engagement in patients. They could measure SMN2. And the pharmacokinetics, which means how long your drug st stays around, was consistent with a lot of work in non-human primates. And I'm going to come on and tell you why the work in non-human primates is so important. And so this was big news in the neurodegenerative disease field. On the 1st of August last year, a clinical trial in a neurodegenerative disease was halted at the interim time point. So halfway through the trial, they did an interim analysis of the phase three in DEER trial, and it was so clear that those children in the, in the placebo group 
that there was such a huge difference in the active to placebo that it would have been unethical to continue the placebo group, the trial was halted. And this had very rapid uh, review by the FDA and granted a license for SMA, and this has been a breakthrough. What's interesting, there is an editorial in this week's Lancet Neurology about this has been a drug that's had Lazarus-like effects, but there's an editorial in this week's Lancet Neurology about the cost, I'm, and I'm happy to discuss, discuss that. So I'm going to show you some unpublished data which was pub presented at the AAN um, earlier this year with some of the data from the SMA trial. And so here, on the um, uh, y-axis is the mean total motor milestone score, which is the scores of children's development. 26 is the highest score, and that's normal motor development. And so here, along here, are scheduled visit days. And I'm going to, if you look here, this is the INDEA study. This was the group of children in blue who were given the active antisense oligonucleotide, and here was the children that were given the placebo. The trial was halted here because most of these children had, had, had either were too sick to continue or had died. And you can see here, these children had continued to improve. These are children that were in the original trial, all an open label, and they have continued to improve and achieve motor milestones. And this is two or three years into the study, and these children are developing. So the children that were not able to sit or move now are able to sit up and achieve motor milestones. But this, I think, is the most important and, and uh, exciting result. So this is the nurture study. If, a par if parents have a child with SMA, they know that they're both carriers for the, for the mutation, and you can screen for your subsequent children at birth. So if your, what's happened now is if your children, subsequent children, are found to carry the SMA, SMN1 mutation, the, the parents were given the option of their newborn children to be able to go into the nurture study where they were given the antisense oligonucleotide from birth. And what's remarkable here, this is the pre-symptomatic study, because these children here were all symptomatic by the time they received treatment. These children have never developed infantile SMA. It's been completely prevented by being given the ASO at birth. And so that, this is evidence for prevention of a neurodegenerative disease. And I think it's a, there's caveats here. This is a neuromuscular disease. Um, it uh, is very aggressive. The um, ASO is working up regulating a protein. So the challenges for neurodegeneration are greater, but this shows that a, a devastating infantile disease is completely preventable. This is normal child development. Most of these kids are dead at six months of age. So this is really remarkable. So there has been a, um, a, a child who, who died actually from unrelated causes in, in the trial and that uh, parents kindly donated the tissue and we were able to look at uh, autopsy material. And the ASO was found throughout the central nervous system and in all throughout the cortex and all five layers of the cortex. So the ASO distributes is, is widespread. So I've been working with Ionis Pharmaceuticals who are a small biotech company. Um, for the last 10 years. And the questions were, can an ASO be designed that potently and specifically reduces Huntington mRNA and protein? Is it safe in preclinical tox studies? Is a non-allele selective approach viable? And does an intrathecally delivered ASO distribute well to brain regions affected by HD? And so the antisense oligonucleotide infused into the CSF are taken up by neurons and non-neuronal cells equally. This is neurons and astrocytes, this is the ASO, and it's equally uh, taken up by all brain cells. And we did a, quite a bit of preclinical work because we were giving intrathecal delivery and we wanted to get the ASO to the brain. And this is data from Yucatan pigs, which have a spinal cord of over 50 centimeters. And these pigs were injected intrathecally with the, ooh, with the ASO. And we measured uh, uh, the level of Huntington mRNA in different regions in the pig brain. And you can see here in the occipital cortex and the temporal cortex and the frontal cortex, there's good lowering, particularly of Huntington lowering with the Huntington ASO. 
This is uh, non-human primate data. I mentioned uh, we, we've done a lot of work on non-human primate dosing to get the doses that we wanted to take into humans. People who say you can go to clinical trials in humans from uh, in vivo cell work to trying to work out doses of agents from cell culture, uh, I think you, it's very difficult to get good dose response work. So this is in non-human primates. And this is exactly the same design as the current trial. Non-human primates were dosed four times at monthly intervals, intrathecal delivery, same regime as the trial. This is RNA and protein. And this is the, the animals were dosed four times at monthly intervals. And a one week after the lows, last dose, the animals were culled and Huntington levels measured. And you can see here very good lowering in the frontal cortex, the occipital cortex. There's about 50% lowering in the very deep structures, the chordate and the thalamus, and about 75% lowering in the hippocampus. This is the data showing how long the drug effect is. The animals, this is one week after the last of the four monthly doses, four weeks after the last of the dose, four monthly doses, and eight weeks later. And you can see here, there's a sustained lowering of Huntington long after the last dose was given. This is now eight weeks. And so it's a cortical predominant pharmacodynamic effect, which lasts about eight weeks. And this is the chordate maximum lowering of Huntington at, at um, uh, one week, but it's some lowering at uh, eight weeks, but 25% lowering when the cortical effect is 50%. So it's a cortical predominant effect, but there is some lowering in deep structures. So uh, ASOs were identified targeting Huntington. I haven't got time to show you all the preclinical data. They improved phenotype and survival in three different HD mouse models even when administered intermittently. And suppression of Huntington in the non-human primate was well tolerated, widespread distribution, and we have now a year and a half of safety data in non-human primates. And the toxicology studies were, were sufficient for us to go to patients. So the questions for the trial was, will the ASO be safe and tolerated in patients? Can we get evidence of target engagement and, and uh, uh, with mutant Huntington? in a short, small study, and what's the best study design? And after a lot of work designing the trial um, uh, and speaking to lots of different regulatory agencies in Germany and Canada and the UK, we dosed the first patient in September 2015 with the first Huntington-lowering therapy. And so the objectives of our trial are to evaluate the safety and tolerability of ascending dose levels, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, to characterize levels of the drug, the ASO, and uh, hunt, mutant Huntington in the CSF, and to look at the effect on a number of biomarkers of mutant Huntington's, uh, of target engagement with mutant Huntington and clinical endpoints. So the, it's in three uh, countries, in nine centers. The drug is given an intrathecally. Patients get four doses and are followed up for 15 weeks. So it's a seven month period. It's, we designed it as a phase 1, 2A, so we wrapped the study together. So it's a multiple ascending dose, so we go right up to quite high doses. So we've, we've done a dosing study as well as a first-in-man study. We randomized 3 to 1 active to placebo, and it was really important to have a placebo group, and I'm happy to discuss that. Um, because it would let, help us look and look at the effects of whether we were seeing any ASO-specific effects. 46 patients are dosed, and I honestly quite a small biotech company, and as Biogen partnered with them for the SMA program, and actually Biogen bought the SMA program, Roche have agreed that if the current trial meets its endpoints, they will go forward with a worldwide phase three $150 million Huntington ASO trial. So it's kind of watch this space. The, uh, this is the study design and overview. This is cohort A. This is the very first dose. We have a data safety monitoring board who meet every uh, uh, three months, review the data blinded and allow us to go to the next dose. And I've got good news. We've completely finished dosing uh, with and uh, had um, things have gone well. We've had no um, big safety issues, or no safety issues, and things are promising such that we've initiated an open label extension. 
The last patient last visit is in November, and we're going to announce the results in early 2018. But so far, so good. And just in the last few minutes of my talk, I'm going to tell you about another program that I've been working with uh, Sangamo uh, on zinc finger repressors. This is much further away from the clinic, but I think it's promising. I think if we want to eventually treat people when they're... 18 years old who carry the HD gene and prevent the disease, I think we may need two prongs, one targeting the striatum and one targeting the cortex with ASOs. And this is zinc finger proteins that are targeting DNA, so right up at the beginning. And, and the problem about allele selective targeting is that targeting SNPs that may be associated with a mutant allele are challenging, and we and others, and we published this recently, have shown that the SNPs, if you target the SNPs with siRNA, they vary in their ability to be targeted selectively. And this is um, a, a, uh, two very popular SNPs that are being taken forward for development, and you can see here, this is compared to a nonsense siRNA, there's no evidence of allele selectivity at all. This SNP in exon 50 is more promising, um, in terms of taking forward for siRNA. But this is only 20% of Caucasians have this SNP, so you're only targeting a very small number of patients. And so zinc finger proteins can bypass all the needs for selectively targeting groups of patients. And zinc finger proteins are, can be linked to a functional domain and the functional domain for Huntington repression is the CRAB domain of the COX-1 protein, which is a, a, a transcriptional repressor, and that allows the zinc finger protein to bind to CAGs. And so there's the Sangamo have been working on engineering zinc finger proteins for allele-specific repression of mutant Huntington. And so it's been designed to preferentially bind expanded CAGs, and what it does is it binds to the expanded CAG and inhibits the transcription start site. And we've been uh, working with Sangamo on this, and they discriminate between a large number of mutant and wild-type CAG alleles, which is good, and uh, there's clearly a dose response, and we're, a lot of work on off-target effects is being done at the moment uh, because a lot of transcription factors have CAGs in them, and we're, it's really important to look for potential off-target effects uh, uh, with CAG targeting. And so this is work um, ongoing because you have to deliver this by uh, AAV gene therapy, and at the moment it's targeting the putamen, it's a sm very small part of the brain, but this is modeling delivery to the putamen with a low flow rate going to a faster flow rate. And I think this is the challenge now for gene therapy, is how do you deliver these sorts of therapies to a, a, a structure the size of the human brain? But on, this is ongoing work to model for taking zinc finger protein uh, preclinically to patients, from preclinical work to patients. And so I think eventually we want to be able to do clinical trials. We want to do what SMA have done. We want to prevent Huntington's disease. And we want to do clinical trials on 18-year-olds who carry the gene, but who are completely well. And uh, uh, we're working on it. And uh, we hope to be able to change this trajectory of disease and prevent the disease. And uh, uh, that's an ongoing effort. And so I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank the teams in the IONIS program that I've been working with, particularly Frank Bennett, who has been leading this, the teams at... Uh, 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 Roche and also the investigators in the UK, Germany and Canada. I'd like to thank all my funders and the patients and families who give enormous amount of time to our research and uh, I'd like to thank you for listening. Sarah, you can join us here. Questions on this talk, on any questions for discussion as well? There's one right in the middle there. Uh, hello, Ronette, University of Porto. Uh, great talk, thank you, Professor Tabri uh, Tabrizi. Uh, two questions about the same thing. So, uh, it's, it's great to know that your ASO uh, study is nearing the end. But what type of 
the patients, most of the re most patients have repeats between 40 and 50 CAGs, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. The, are the patients in your study in that range, or are you also including larger repeats, which have uh, usually younger uh, mm -hmm. ages of onsets? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, what about the patients with the 35 to 40, the, mm -hmm. the incomplete penetrance? Do you think it's worth thinking uh, about testing something, or is it the incomplete uh, nature of the penetrance? Like, it's not, if it's worth or not the yeah. very invasive mm. type of treatment. So, good questions. So, the current trial, we had to, we've, we had to uh, put, uh, have patients in the current trial with stage one disease, so early disease, so they could give full informed consent because it was a first in man study. Um, and we, cho we wanted CAGs between 40 and 50, which is the typical adult onset, as you, as you say, uh, because we needed a homogeneous population. And I think for the ongoing trials, we've been doing a lot of work on stratification of patients for the trials, because you can have the best drug in the world, and if you don't have a good phase three trial design, it's just, it's, it's wasted. And so uh, a lot of thought has, been gone, has gone into that, and it's probably CAG between 40 and 55, because it's the adult onset. Incomplete penetrant CAGs between 36 and 39, it's a, it's a difficult group. At the moment, they're excluded from trials because they may or may not develop the disease. I think it's going to change the whole face of Huntington's disease if the trial's successful. Because I think what will happen is people who, only 20% of people have a genetic test for Huntington's disease. Uh, I think what will happen is that everyone will want a genetic test because there's a therapy available. And uh, it will then be able to be given to everyone, juvenile patients, those with reduced penetrance. But I think a big, a big area for future discussion is cost. The SMA drug, I mean, this is what I was mentioning about the editorial, these are expensive drugs. Um, and Biogen are charging $750,000 a year. It's huge. And so that's why, I mean, the drug has a remarkable effect, but um, it's a huge price tag. Um, uh, the good thing about working so closely with Roche is that, because uh, you need them to be able to develop drugs, to be able to do huge trials, is that uh, we, um, I, I think their, market, their, their pricing campaign will be different. But it, they're very good questions about the groups of people and, and more widespread. I think for the ASO, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ASOs in development now for TAU. That was recently published in Science Translational Medicine. Uh, Nature paper recently on SCAR2, uh, SCAR1 and SCAR3 are in development. I think if the HD trial is positive, I think there'll be a lot of ASO trials being put forward and, and also including alpha-synuclein because it'll show a proof of concept. So maybe Ionis won't end up as a small biotech company anymore. <laughs> Other questions? There one. On top left. Hi, uh, I'm John Yanis Sotiropoulos from Uminio here in Portugal. So, uh, can, I, can I ask about the, the normal function and the loss of normal function of the protein? And, and this is specifically relevant uh, with, with this middle you know, cohort that the, the patients or, or individuals that they don't have so many repeats. And, and the reason I'm asking, I'm, I'm, I can very easily remember some work done in, in us uh, with ataxin and massage disease, where uh, the loss of ataxin itself is also detrimental for the neurons. So how you see, how see the, the loss of normal function of Huntington and how neurons can cope with that, especially for these AIDS? Because if we reach the stuff that everybody can do it, so what will stop them to do it, even with people that they have just a few repeats? Very good question, and, and it's been a big area for thought and discussion. So the ASO targets total Huntington. The wild-type Huntington is essential for embryological development, and uh, we know that. If you knock out wild-type Huntington embryogenesis, it's embryonic lethal. What appears now from a lot of different safety studies and studies done by many different people and, and groups is that lowering wild-type Huntington in the adult non-human primate or rodent brain for two to three years is safe. 
So that was why our uh, human trial has, was so important, because it's, it was, can we lower wild-type Huntington, uh, it's lowering total Huntington, and we were, it was really important for safety. And I think what's reassuring is, so far, there haven't been any safety issues. And so one of the things about the open label extension is it will be a long-term safety study in the same way that they did with the um, SMA ASO. I think it's a very important area. Uh, what I, so I get asked a lot about what therapy would I give to people when, one day when we find a treatment. I would probably give an allele selective approach to children who carry the gene one day to try and prevent the disease because it's allele selective, like the zinc finger, but you can only target a small part of the brain. And in the future, then when people are adult, early adult, or with 18 year olds, you could give them an antisense, which is against total Huntington. So I think the issue of lowering a wild type protein is really important, and it's a big area in ataxin 2 as well. It's, it's a big area in the spinal cerebellar ataxias, but it's, it's, a, good, it's a good point. I have also a question for you, Sarah. I, uh, what is your perception on the limitations of each approach, the ASO and the accessibility and the viral delivery and the permanent mm -hmm. and the side effects? Mm -hmm. what, that's one, one thing. And the other question is, uh, you mentioned tau, synuclein, yeah. ASOs, but do you envision them in non-genetic forms of tauopathies and synucleopathies? or only in those that are yeah, so unique, like the biotone, the dystrophy, Huntington, SMA? Yeah, yeah. The two, the, it's a very good question. So the, um, I uh, uh, very much like the ASO approach. Mainly I've been working with them for a long time and I like the, the science and the technology uh, because it was reversible and you could titrate the dose. Um, and that was why the non-human primate data was important, because you can actually, it diffuses to quite a large amount of the brain, it gets right into the deep layers of the cortex. So um, the, the, the AAV at the moment really just targets a small part of the brain. So in whether, whatever disease they're, they're, it's being developed for, whether Parkinson's or Huntington's, for Huntington's it just at the moment can target the putamen. You know, the whole adult brain is 1,500 grams and the striatum is 20 grams. It's a tiny part of it. So the challenge of gene therapy for the human brain is how do you get it to the whole brain? And that is a subject of a whole session in itself is gene. Um, but the pro it's also permanent and irreversible. So you've got to be absolutely sure before you do that injection. And so the, the Voyager program, which is um, a single shot is non-allele selective, and I probably, you know, I, I would be concerned about that at this stage. I think um, uh, for the other um, therapies, the SCAR-1, 2, 3 is obvious, it's, they're uh, inherited ataxias. Tau at the moment is, uh, Tau ASO is just entering first in man studies for Alzheimer's disease, for mild Alzheimer's disease targeting tau. And uh, Mark Diamond, who's a very good colleague of mine, has been doing a lot of work in the initial workup for the tau ASO. It's a, it's a similar approach to why people are looking at tau antibodies, but it's intrathecal and it's g getting into the brain. alpha synuclein anti uh, ASOs for Parkinson's are the same. So there are, it is now being thought of as development for neurodegenerative diseases. So I think it's a kind of, I think what's interesting about the HD study is I think if it shows that um, it, we got good target engagement, I think it'll be the, the, the people are going to be, become more excited for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's because they're much commoner. But Huntington's is a genetic dementia, so it's the, it's, if we can target a genetic dementia, it's the beginning. It may have hope for the other diseases. I have a question which I think applies to, to all of these studies when they come to uh, clinical study design. Um, you mentioned the, the non-human primate studies and the safety, which I think is really, really yeah. important. But when we looked at the pediatric SMN studies, uh, we saw this placebo group. Mm. So we saw this Lazarus effect. Yeah. But at the same time, you have yeah. a long placebo group lasting, I think, up to 300 and something days or yeah, visits. They were. It was visits. terminated. Yeah. So um, you also mentioned in, that in your study now, there's a three to one mm. active versus placebo ratio. In this kind of diseases, where uh, you're not really comparing the state of the art treatment with the new option, mm. you're comparing no option with an option, 
Um, how ethical is it to do that? Yeah. And what are you going to do if you do observe, and I hope you do, because yeah, this is yeah, a beautiful yeah, yeah. study, if you do observe a Lazarus effect, mm. a or, or even a very yeah, yeah, clear yeah. effect, what are you going to do to this placebo group? Can you move them? Yeah. What you, do we do? Can that is such a great question. And actually, we organized a, a conference. John Hardy and I organized a conference with The Lancet last year. And this was a whole day discussion mm. of, is it ethical to have a placebo group? In pre-symptomatic trials, this was a pre-symptomatic. I completely agree with you. The SMA, the original trial, which was our mm. equivalent, was an open label because they decided it was such a terrible disease of babies. It had to be open label for safety and tolerability. But when that went to phase three, the, the, the regulatory agencies like the FDA, people want to randomize control trial um, to show that the drug has a huge difference from placebo. And, and there was a big discussion whether you should compare it to a historical control group of children who you know have the disease who would be... And, and I think for, for SMA, that was such a big discussion. Uh, and I agree with you. It's, is it, was it ethical to have that placebo group? But, in, in, but the can, in the cancer but I think field, in Huntington's, a single arm studies. I think in Huntington's, it's the same issue because... I think we'd have to do a phase three group, a phase three mm -hmm. study with the placebo group. We will have to. But if it then shows that it's beneficial in that early stage, yes. say the two-year trial's yes. positive, would you then want to be in the placebo group if you were a gene carrier yeah. for yeah. HD and knew you were going to yeah. develop the disease? Would you want to be in the placebo group for five years, knowing yeah. that you were going to develop it and a drug yeah. had been shown to be effective? No. And so a colleague of mine, Mike Rollins, who's the chairman of NICE, said, would the oral contraceptive pill ever have... The oral contraceptive pill yeah, was licensed exactly. without a placebo group trial. Because would you be yeah. in the placebo group uh, trialing the oral contraceptive pill in the 60s? Yeah. Obviously not. And that was actually licensed yeah. without yeah. a randomized yeah. control trial. So he uses that as an yeah. example to say. Yeah. So I think actually the debate at this meeting was that we, should, we shouldn't have a placebo group yeah. in pre-symptomatic trials yeah. because would you want to be in the placebo group? And I think it's a bad on the money question and I think you know as therapies come through this is going to be a question yeah. that, that is going to be debated because the regulatory agencies are not are not so supportive of that they want to have a placebo controlled trial do they have to remain um, treated with placebo for the whole duration yeah. of the trial or a halfway yeah. like in some cases yeah. it has happened for PSP or others yeah so 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 Maria is saying can you do an interim analysis so that's what we're going to do in the phase yeah. three two-year trial we're going to do a one-year analysis if it's so clear that there's such a, a divergence then we'll halt the trial so you can you can but you have to pre-specify that you're going to do an interim analysis yeah. like they did in the SMA trial they pre-specified that at the, the, the mid time point they were going to do an interim analysis but you have to pre-specify you can't just yeah. decide to yeah. do it you also can't expect all the diseases to be the same Absolutely. 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 One year can still be a long time for yes. many of these diseases. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. a long time. I know, I know. I think, it's, it's, I think the SMA trial has really resulted in lots of different questions for the community in these diseases, about, um, for rare diseases as well. They're absolutely uh, critical questions. And these are also questions for Parkinson. So yeah. Michael J. Fox is sponsoring a lot of, uh, not as, but also as, but uh, male interference RNA and yeah. SH RNA. And so that is the same problem. Mm. They, start, they start with patients with duplication or triplication mm. of the alpha synuclein gene, but it seems now that also in uh, sporadic cases, for some reason, at some point, you could have a beginning of uh, an higher expression of the protein. That's right. And so that is exactly the debate. When, how do you set up these trials because clearly some people will, f uh, will, will not feel happy about it. And also the, your point just to, is, is in the HIV field, when they were trying mm -hmm. to trial um, antiretroviral yeah. treatment, when it had been shown that the drugs were effective at preventing HIV replication, they couldn't recruit people to the trial when it had a placebo yeah. group because they, people didn't want to be in the trial and people were trying to buy the drug, you know, get into the yeah. trials through different routes. And so I think it's, it's a huge area for yeah. discussion that, 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 that needs yeah. to come out yeah. because uh, regulators need to see what people feel. Exactly. Thank you very much for...
three wonderful talks and the presentation. Thank you. We will be back here 10 minutes later than before because we're leaving late, but please be seated by 4.40. Thank you. <laughs>